thank you all and I appreciate how, how valuable it is to have you all in this room at lunchtime. So thank you for coming. I'm delighted, as Bill said, to come and talk a little bit about my new book. I'm supposed to point that at there. Um, but also I think we can talk about whatever else you are interested in in terms of the changes inside Japan. I understand Professor Samuels has already been here. Um, it's an incredible time to be looking not only at Japan but at the interactions in Northeast Asia broadly. Uh, it's, a, as Bill said, we are doing a project at CFR now that is a three-year project that looks at sort of the interactions, the reactive nationalisms between Japan, South Korea, and China. Uh, and of course, this is the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. So in Northeast Asia, uh, history, war memory, and the nationalist politics surrounding those issues were an incredibly, continue to be an incredibly important topic on this anniversary. But what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about intimate rivals, about the Japan-China relationship, give you a sense of beyond the book where I think Japan-China relations are today and what we should expect and kind of what it means for the United States. Uh, it's a very important policy challenge, I think, a policy challenge on the scale that I think Washington really hasn't had to deal with before in Asia. We have a, our closest ally now in a fairly tense and potentially military uh, ten tense and antagonistic relationship with its largest neighbor, the rising power. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that shorthand, the rising power, but for policymakers in Washington, which is where I sit, the Council on Foreign Relations Washington office, we spend a lot of time in what they call track two d discussions or track 1.5 if you're working with the Chinese, um, talking about what this really means for the alliance and what it means for Washington's priorities, not only to build deterrence, uh, for the U.S.-Japan alliance, but also what's our new role in crisis management uh, in the region, and particularly between Japan and China. But let me tell you a little bit about intimate rivals, and everybody, everywhere I go, everybody asks me, why intimate rivals? Why the title? Uh, it's not a I, international relations theory kind of title. Normally you don't use the word intimate to talk about international relations. Um, but this is a relationship between Japan and China that goes back centuries. It's a cultural relationship, it's an economic relationship. It has been, in many ways, it was an imperial relationship in the 20th century, right? Uh, and it's a deep, economically interdependent relationship today. Continues to be so, despite the political tensions. Um, so when, you, when the Japanese, you know, I wrote a lot, my PhD dissertation was on Japanese security planning and the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, but I, I could feel in the early 2000s when I was going back and forth that something was fundamentally changing in terms of Japanese attitudes towards China. Uh, about the kinds of issues that they were worried about in the, in the bilateral relationship with Beijing, issues that they hadn't had to worry about before. You'll probably be familiar with most of them, but in the 1990s, of course, the Cold War came to an end. Northeast Asia took on a slightly different tone. You had uh, the nuclear crisis with North Korea in 93, 94, in which the Clinton administration actually had to consider whether we were going to deploy force uh, to deal with that on the Korean Peninsula. We had in 1996 a Taiwan Straits crisis. We hadn't had them since the 50s, remember, at the beginning of the Cold War. But we had a real problem in 1996 because Taiwan, for the first time, was going to have a government that did not buy into the two China uh, idea, that had as its campaign platform, in fact, the idea that Taiwan ought to declare independence from mainland China. So 1996, was a very tough time. The Chinese decided they were going to respond with missiles, at least the threat of moving missiles closer to Taiwan in an effort to intimidate Taiwan. So the United States and Japan were looking at Northeast Asia uh, through a very different lens in the 1990s as the Cold War had ended and this new Northeast Asia was emerging. Um, China's own military modernization, its testing of nuclear weapons, uh, its decision to use force in the Taiwan Straits, at least coercively, to, to shape Taiwanese electoral behavior. All of this woke the Japanese up a little bit to the fact that this was a different China. This was not a China that was necessarily a sanguine neighbor, um, but also that clearly China was on a trajectory that was going to ultimately be antithetical to Japanese security interests. Um, before that, you largely had a relationship between Japan and China that was focused first and foremost on economic interdependence, right? When Deng Xiaoping announced his uh, market reforms in 1978, changing the trajectory of China, uh, Japan was negotiating its peace treaty. Uh, the Nixon visit to China had happened in the early 70s, right? We had normalized our relationship with Beijing, but in seven, by the end of the 70s, the Japanese were, were concluding their discussions, their negotiations of their post-war peace treaty. 
Uh, and it's exactly at this time, of course, that Deng Xiaoping saw that it, having a close relationship with Japan would not only be good in terms of regional diplomacy, but would also be good for the market reforms that he was trying to put forward. So he went to Tokyo uh, to ratify this bilateral treaty. And in Tokyo, he spent, or in Japan rather, he spent a long time going around looking at Japanese factories, looking at Japan's own experience of modernization, and held a press conference. And these are the words that will come back. Uh, it'll be more interesting later on when we talk about the island dispute. But at that press conference, he said, you know, we have a lot of differences, but we have a bigger, a larger aim in this relationship, which is to normalize ties and to re-embrace our economic partnership. Um, and also, we have this little delicate issue of a territorial dispute but we'll leave this to future generations, the wisdom of future generations to resolve. So the Chinese at that time, uh, much to the relief of the Japanese, frankly, um, understood that it was not in their interest to push the territorial issue, that the larger relationship with Japan was the prize, and that the territory of these, fall, these, these little tiny islands in the middle of the East China Sea was not going to be a, a point of difference between the two countries. This will come back, as you know, uh, in 2010 and 2012 uh, to be a different story in the relationship. But over time, from the 78 treaty into the 1990s, uh, you have a, a, a Japan that is underwriting Japan's market reforms. Japanese ODA, Overseas Development Assistance to China, uh, was 50% of Japan's overseas development assistance. And as you know, the 1980s, Japan was the world's economic superpower. It was rich, right? It had a lot of money to offer. Uh, it basically helped China build the infrastructure that it now has, upon which its modernization was proceeded. Japanese companies went in, and again, it's detailed in the book, but they went in in, in a major way in building, helping the Chinese build steel, shipbuilding, uh, later manufacturing. So Japanese corporate investment in, in China was very, very high. So you have a public investment in Chinese economic transformation and a private investment by Japanese companies as well. Um, so when you get in the into the 1990s, of course, this starts to change. For the Japanese companies, the China market's a little bit less predictable. Some bad economic decision making by the Chinese, but there's a little bit more risk for Japanese companies. Nonetheless, the Japanese foreign direct investment in China is the highest. Uh, at, at sometimes it was second number, number three to Hong Kong before Hong Kong returned to China, uh, and it was number uh, sec it's number two now to Taiwanese investment in China. So Japanese investment capital was incredibly important to the Chinese, but the Japanese were getting a little bit more hesitant about China's decision making, its own market decision making. Um, by the 1990s, in addition to the strategic threat and this change in the way the economies were interacting, um, you also get a, a kind of rescinding of ODA. China graduates from this notion that it needs development assistance from Japan. And also, it's also getting a lot of investment and assistance from other countries as well. Japan's no longer its major suitor. Uh, it's a different country. It's a different relationship, and it has much more diversified sources of funding. So the Japanese become one among many in the economic relationship with China, which wasn't the case for their first two decades. The other thing that changes uh, in the 1990s, of course, is the Japanese themselves are changing. Uh, in the 1990s, Japan's pol politics go undergo significant uh, change. In 1993, 94, they move away from what we political scientists call a single party dominant system. The conservatives who had ruled Japan for decades uh, after the post-war broke up and you had a kaleidoscope of political parties that were coming in uh, to try to contend for power in Japan. So the 1990s is an era of political change for the Japanese. It's also an era of economic stagnation. For those of you who study Japan, the term lost decades is the term the Japanese used to talk about uh, the 1990s. Their economic performance uh, sta stagnated. They made bad decisions. Their banking sector was unregulated, badly regulated, right? So there were a lot of problems. The Japan incorporated model, the economic superpower, began to look a little bit more flawed. And this also, in some ways, changed the appetite in Tokyo for the kind of relationship they'd had with Beijing. So coming out of the 1990s, you also have one final factor that I think is pretty important. Um, we had, in, in the late 80s, of course, a crisis with Beijing called the Tiananmen Square uh, incident in which the Western countries had decided that the treatment of the Chinese students in Tiananmen Square, the use of force against Chinese nationals, was a source of sanctions on human rights grounds of Ch with China. The Japanese didn't follow the same path as us. 
But by the end of the 1990s, you begin to get Japanese governments that begin to point out human rights problems in China. You begin, begin to get Japanese citizens who begin to identify with the Uyghurs or the Tibet problem. So you start to see it not in a very systematic way, but you start to see in Japan some concern about the type of government uh, that you see in, that, that was prevalent uh, in China. Not that it was communist, but that the citizen, citizens, the Chinese citizens themselves, were being mistreated. And that was a new aspect uh, in the bilateral relationship. So when I was in Tokyo and I was looking at Japan's relationship with China in the early 2000s, two things. I didn't start out saying this is a story about China's rise, but I could sense a couple of things going on. One was in the trade relationship between the two countries, you were beginning to have trade disputes between Japan and China. Now this is usual for Americans. We had trade disputes throughout the 80s with the Japanese, but Japan had never really had trade disputes with the Chinese. So it began with things like shiitake mushrooms or tatami, uh, but it, it then quickly escalated into a broad array of problems. And they didn't have bilateral mechanisms with which to deal with the trade disputes. They had to create them. Um, another thing is that the security environment began to get even more concerning to Tokyo because all the Chinese maritime behavior in and around the Japanese archipelago began to become much more conspicuous. Both countries had ratified the UN law of the sea in the mid-1990s, but it wasn't really until the 2000s that the Japanese understood that they needed a different way of thinking about their oceans policy. Again, I write about that in the book, but they didn't really change their domestic policy making process to respond to their unclose, uh, the unclose dynamics that came with the ratification. China also ratified around the same time. So what you see in terms of maritime uh, behavior is not necessarily naval behavior, although there was an aspect of that. But survey ships were in Japanese waters surveying. Um, there was a lot of interaction between the, what Lyle, your, your, your experts of the Chinese Maritime Institute talk about the five dragons that once existed, right? Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, kind of interactions between Japanese uh, reconnaissance flights in the East China Sea and the beginnings of a Chinese response to that. In large part, it was a civilian problem. It was a law enforcement survey, geological, fisheries patrols, those kinds of problems in the early 2000s. But as you know, by the time you get to 2010, the territorial dispute erupted and the militaries themselves began to become engaged in the problem. Um, the, one, the, the, 2000, the decade of the 2000s, of course, does have some bright spots. Uh, President Hu Jintao visits Tokyo in 2008, and the Prime Minister at the time, Fukuda, uh, concludes two agreements with him that were very important. One was an agreement on energy, joint energy development in the East China Sea, and the second was an agreement on food safety. And the reason those two are important is detailed in my book, and I won't go through all the details of the food safety issue, because I don't think those, that's what you're concerned about really here. But if you are, it's, it's a fascinating story. Um, but the maritime boundary dispute became a, a serious point of contention uh, in that decade for the first time. Now in the book, I go through a number of case studies of areas and problems that the Japanese were obviously having with China. And I identified four case studies one is the old-fashioned Yaskuni Shrine issue, so for those of you issued, interested in war memory, that's a great chapter. Um, the second was on the maritime boundary dispute, which we didn't really talk about until the territorial issue arose in the, in the late 2000s. The food security issue is really about food, processed food, that comes from China, imported into Japan, that becomes a problem, and Japanese consumers all of a sudden are aware that a large part of their food is not only grown in China, but processed by Japanese companies in China. And then the last is the, is the chapter about the island dispute or the territorial dispute. So I thought what I'd do here is talk a little bit about two issues. One is the, the island dispute itself and also the maritime boundary dispute, um, largely because these are issues that are still going on today. The larger picture, before I get to that, the specifics of the case though, the larger question in my mind in the 2000s was just why was the relationship becoming so poisoned? Why was this bilateral relationship that Tokyo and Beijing had had their differences over war memory, right? They'd had their differences, they'd recognized they had a territorial dispute, but they'd never really fought over it. In fact, the two governments had managed the dispute quite quietly, but effectively, uh, all the way up until 2010. They had managed to come to terms in some cases with the, some of the, the trade and economic disputes. They had managed in some cases to deal with some of the more tender issues of war memory. The Japanese emperor 
was invited to Beijing in 1992. And he was greeted there very warmly, had spent six days in the country. Uh, and so that was for many Japanese seen as the end in some ways of the difficult process of post-war reconciliation. So again, what, what was, the, what was, what was the, the, the problem is the recurring question of war memory, the recurring question of, of the territorial dispute, but there were these new issues of food safety and the maritime boundary dispute as well that had their roots in very contemporary issues of problem solving. So this is, uh, since I'm at the Naval War College, this is all very familiar territory to you guys, so I'll just flip through very fast. Um, Japan's not the only country that has territorial disputes with China, and those have proliferated clearly uh, for some time. But let's talk about the specifics of the Senkakus. Um, and again, ap apologies if this is something you already know a lot about. Um, the Senkakus, I think a lot of people, unless you actually physically go there, uh, you know they exist in the middle of the East China Sea. You can point them out in a map, probably. Um, but what's not, I, I was down doing research in Ishigaki, which you'll see down there, is one of the Okinawan islands that has the administrative responsibility for the Senkakus. In other words, the Senkakus are part of the municipality that is uh, Ishigaki. Um, that's as close as you can get in Okinawa to those islands. And if you're a fisherman, you'll get in a very small boat, probably 15 to 25 feet. They're not very big. Uh, and you will go through one of the worst uh, currents, the black current that runs between Ishigaki and the Senkakus. It's great for fishing. <coughs> Brings all kinds of great big fat fish at certain times of the year, but it's a very treacherous current if you're a, a, a fisherman in a small boat. Uh, it'll take you anywhere from five to ten hours to reach those islands in good weather. If the weather is bad, you may never get there. So that's also another story uh, for the fishermen of Ishigaki. They have for a long time advocated to Tokyo that they build a port on the largest of the Senkaku Islands, which is Uotsuri, right up there on, the, on this side, the top. Uh, that's the island that had been inhabited pr prior to World War II by a very small f uh, factory owner and about 200 uh, very impoverished Japanese. And they had bonito, they made bonito flakes and they collected seagull guano, is the polite word for it. Um, and they um, exported it all the way to Europe, right? The, it was a great fertilizer in the pre-war period, apparently. Um, but it was inhabited up until about 1937. But that's where the, uh, the fishermen of uh, Okinawa wanted their government to build a small harbor, a port, so that they, if they got all the way out to the Senkakus to fish, if the weather turned bad, which it often did, they would have some place to shelter. Um, that didn't happen, largely because, the and again, it's detailed in the book, but it's largely because the negotiations with China over the peace treaty, the Japanese government decided to pull back from inhabiting the island at that time. So there was an implicit compromise, not an explicit agreement, but there was an implicit compromise made in conjunction with that 78 treaty that many of the people in Ishigaki and other parts of Okinawa felt was really not in their interest. Uh, nonetheless, most of the mainland Japanese had very little interest or perhaps even knowledge about what went on out in the Senkagus. The interests were really uh, the fishermen. The other interests down there in the East China Sea, uh, and of course, again, I should say that Taiwan has uh, a very deep interest in fishing in the waters around those islands, which is why the, the Taiwanese themselves are also uh, a, a main actor in this story. The Chinese, uh, sorry, the Taiwanese fishermen from northern fishermen's ports uh, presented themselves when the Japanese and Chinese were having difficulties in 2010 and again in 2012. They, the Taiwanese Coast Guard, also got in the mix uh, when the tensions uh, got high in the fall of 2012 but we won't talk too much about Taiwan uh, at this point. The other interest that was very important here, of course, is oil and gas. In the late 1960s, the United Nations had a survey, a geological survey of the East China Sea, and that report, you can find it online. It made everybody in East, uh, East Asia very excited because it reported the geologists were Korean, Taiwanese, American, and uh, Japanese, and others. No mainland Chinese, by the way. Um, but they basically reported that the East China Sea had hydrocarbon resources per perhaps on the scale of the Middle East. So they were very ambitious in their report. Uh, it made all the countries of Northeast Asia uh, very excited about potential resource, seabed resources, uh, and oil and gas in particular. So all of a sudden, at the late 1960s, before 
the Senkakus returned to Japanese control, there was a great interest in potentially exploring this for petroleum resources. Today, that is still part of the unspoken uh, interests of the Chinese, Taiwanese, and Japanese in and around those islands. So two basic sets of interests that are engaged here on the Japanese side, fisheries and oil and gas. But to, again, to go back to who has control over these islands, physically asserting control over these islands is a hard thing to do. You can't sustain human life. Uh, there's no fresh running water. So if you were going to populate these islands again, uh, you'd have to have regular shipments of food and water and supply. Uh, but these are the islands that the Chinese and Japanese are now contending uh, over. All right. We all know that the Chinese have a lot of sovereignty claims. Senkaku or Diaoyidao are not the only islands that they have uh, interest in, so we don't need to talk to you about this, and that's just, we can come back to that. The maritime boundary dispute, I think, was the lesser known of the disputes between Japan and China, especially now that we get very focused on the territorial dispute. This is a new dispute, relatively speaking. It's a dispute that emerged and erupted alongside the ratification of UNCLOS, so it really became a problem in the late 1990s when again, both countries had ratified, both countries needed to do the survey work to try to determine and support their claims. Uh, you may know that the Japanese have, th there is not 400 nautical miles between Japan and China in, across the East China Sea. Uh, so they have to negotiate their, their maritime boundary and that's pretty common practice under UNCLOS, right? Uh, the Japanese suggested that dark line up the middle, which is what they call the median line. The Chinese instead want the dotted line not sure where to point, um, but that dotted line that goes right through the Senkaku Islands corresponds to the continental shelf. And so the Chinese make an argument that the continental shelf is the proper uh, um, dividing line between uh, EEZ claims for, for China and Japan. They have not resolved this, they haven't negotiated their differences, um, and therefore it, this is the claim that continues to, this is the dispute that continues. Um, the ADIZ, the Air Defense Identification Zone, for those of you who follow that, <laughs> that was announced by the Chinese in November of 2013, also corresponds pretty much geographically along the same continental shelf, uh, longitude, latitude. So there's consistency here. Peter Dutton and I were just talking about it. He talks about jurisdictional claims, overlapping jurisdictional claims that the Chinese are putting forward, and this is very consistent with his argument uh, is displayed here a little bit. Um, so the maritime border issue really became an issue in the early 2000s. The Chinese and Japanese decided to try to negotiate their, their differences. Uh, they were not successful. The Chinese in the meantime began to build uh, gas rigs off of one part of the, uh, uh, across, well, on their side of the Japanese median line. But I'll just point it to because I don't have a pointer. But they are right in here. And the gas field, the Japanese called the Shirakaba and the Chinese <coughs> called the sh Xinjiao, I think. I, my Chinese pronunciation is very bad, so don't trust my pronunciation, but they're named differently by the Japanese and the Chinese. So they began to, to build uh, rigs. The Japanese didn't like the idea that they were building rigs before they had decided on the boundary. But the Chinese were on the Japanese, on their own side of Japan's median boundary. Um, by, by 2005, the frustration was mounting and you started to hear the Japanese government say, fine, if you're gonna go ahead, then we're gonna go ahead and issue permits for our oil and gas industry to also uh, build rigs. Now, in my interviews, it was interesting. It took me a long time to get to talk to the oil and gas interests, and it's one of these sort of things that's not very academic and social science-y, but I finally got somebody to talk to me <laughs> on the condition of anonymity, uh, because it's a, very, it's a very sensitive topic in Japan. Um, but the oil and gas interests were really not, not interested in the gas field that was that section I just showed you. It wasn't commercially viable. They really didn't want to fuss, and they really didn't want to build rigs. Um, they also told me that they didn't want to go out there with rigs without proper defenses, and they didn't feel that their government was really ready to, to deploy you know, maritime self-defense force destroyers to defend those rigs, in which case they were not going to go out there themselves. Um, but there was a second area in the 2008 agreement that was interesting, and that was a much more profitable enterprise for the Japanese, and I'll come on this map this time. <laughs> and so there's an area up here which is just south of the Japan-South Korea Joint Development Zone. And the Japan-South Korea uh, Joint 
development zone had not produced any good outcome for oil or gas. So it was, it was a bust. <coughs> but the section just below it had not been exploited, had not been explored. It was deep water drilling, so the technology was just coming online for exploitation, or at least exploration. That's where the Japanese felt that the Chinese and Japanese had a potential to really have something that was commercially viable. So that's where the industry side on the Japan side was most interested in having both governments come to some kind of terms on this. So Hu Jintao comes to, to Tokyo in May of 2008. He comes with, an e with a joint development uh, agreement for the East China Sea. They sign it. It's a great accomplishment for the two governments. And six months later, it's dead in the water. And stories differ about why, but largely the implementation agreement, with the step that comes next, uh, that the Chinese felt that they couldn't go forward with the implementation agreement. Uh, so you'll have to talk to your China scholars about why that may have been the case. Uh, but it falls apart by the end of 2008. The important part about the Joint Energy Development Agreement is that it, it ignored their differences over who had the rights to those resources, right? This was the compromise position that was going to bring Japan and China together to cooperate in the, across these different ideas of where their boundaries were uh, in the East China Sea. The other aspect, of course, this is probably where I, I, there's some expertise in the room, um, is the defense side. Um, underneath the Senkaku Islands, you'll see in that little circle up there, is some uh, fairly interesting water for submarines and other kinds of behaviors, of course, right? Um, so the oil and, and gas development was one political way of managing the maritime boundary differences, but the security concerns of the Japanese um, were highlighted basically given the, the defenses and their needs in, the, in, in Okinawa. The Okinawa trough is a fairly po uh, populated space. Japanese themselves have a fairly uh, sophisticated conventional submarine force. Uh, they were concerned largely because of Chinese activities in and around that were going to compromise uh, some of their submarine activities. But as you know, the United States also is very active in that region as well. Um, so what was going on above ground uh, and what was going on underwater um, were two different things and by the end of the with the end of the East China Sea Joint Development Agreement I think it became pretty much a strategic concern for the Japanese that there wasn't going to be a way for Japan and China to share the East China Sea other than to talk about their strategic impact on each other. All right we can talk about this later if you'd like during the q and A. I think you know what two things happened uh, on the territorial dispute that I think are important. Um, so jumping from maritime boundaries to the specifics of the eruption of tensions, right, uh, in 2010 and again in 2012. 2010, you had a government in power uh, that was new to governing Japan. You'd had an election in 2009 that brought for the first time in the post-war period uh, a new party into, into power in Japan. You'd had a single party conservative government uh, all the way from 1955 until 2009. And all of a sudden, in 2009, you have this brand new party, the Democratic Party of Japan, that didn't have a lot of experience in foreign policy or security. Uh, it was a liberal left party that was uh, somewhat antagonistic to the US military presence in Japan. Uh, it wanted to renegotiate the status of forces agreement with the United States. Uh, but it didn't have a concerted opinion on China policy. Uh, it had an interest in improving relations with Beijing. It wanted to improve relations both with both South Korea and Beijing and wanted to find a, a new kind of East Asian community within which Japan could find a, a better relationship in the region. Um, this is the party that was in power when a fairly inebriate, inebriated, drunken uh, uh, trawler captain right, ran into two Japanese Coast Guard ships off of the Senkaku Islands. Let me go back. Sorry. So the fishing, the fishing trawler was there. It was in Japanese territorial 12 nautical mile waters off the islands. Uh, it refu he refused to get out. He was confronted by one Japan Coast Guard vessel, much larger than him, and he took flight, uh, but then came back into the, nautical, into the 12, 12 mile nautical waters, and then the second Coast Guard ship came to assist. And in the end, he rammed both of the ships. Uh, creating a, a huge dilemma for the Japanese government. He was arrested, he was boarded and arrested eventually. Uh, his crew detained, the ship detained, he was taken to Ishigaki Island, uh, 
which is where the Coast Guard uh, ships were from. Uh, he was detained, his crew was let, let go to the Chinese government and the ship was allowed to return to the Chinese government, but the captain himself was detained. He was uh, indicted or he was being prosecuted to be potentially indicted under Japanese law uh, for obstructing the Japanese Coast Guards uh, in the line of duty. So basically getting, getting in the way of their law enforcement activities. Um, this was the first time that a Chinese national had ever been detained and threatened to be prosecuted under Japanese law. In the book, I chronicle a whole bunch of other incidents in and around these islands, some by fishermen, some by activists, uh, and they are arrested, detained, and transferred back to the Chinese government within a week or so. This time was different, and there's a lot of debate over whether or not they ought to have done that, um, but it was a departure from the way the Japanese and Chinese governments had handled these incidents in the past. He was detained. Uh, the prosecutor's office in Nahad said that they, they would extend his detention until they could put him forward for indictment, and that's the moment when the Chinese government becomes uh, very enraged, and that's at, at, at that point you've got two things that had uh, happened. One, that China uh, imposed an informal embargo on rare earth materials. Uh, not a formal embargo, but all of a sudden customs houses weren't allowing these rare earth materials to come out to Japanese companies and corporations that needed them. Uh, the second was at the moment that the Naha prosecutor's office announced the, in, the intent to prosecute and indict, uh, the Chinese government arrested uh, four Japanese businessmen in China. They were there, ironically, to help uh, defuse chemical weapons bombs that had been left by the Japanese Imperial Army. It was a, it was a reconciliation project that had been in the works for years. Uh, they worked for Fujitsu Company. They were detained and arrested for spying on Chinese military I installations. Um, the man with the video camera said we had no idea that it was a military installation, so I think largely the Japanese government understood that this was a tit-for-tat kind of hostage situation. Um, I can go into all the details of the escalatory path, but by the, by the end of this escalation, Secretary of State Clinton had reminded the Chinese publicly that the islands are protected under Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, and Wen Jiabao had gone to the U.N. General Assembly, and in the evening before met with the Committee of 100, which is a leading Chinese-American uh, group in the United States, and threatened to go to, no, to go to any length it took to get that captain back. Uh, and so, um, the escalator, es escalation into this third party realm, into the United Nations and into the alliance, was the first time for Japan and China to have that kind of uh, diplomatic tensions. Long and the short, the captain was released. Three of the Fujitsu guys were released. Uh, the fourth Fujitsu man in China, detained in China wasn't released for another month, uh, but he eventually came home. Uh, by this time, the Chinese fishing trawler captain was safely in, in China. Um, that experience on the Japanese side as I argue in the book, really transformed a lot of the domestic debate in Japan uh, about how the crisis was handled, but also whether or not Japan was really ready to deal with this new China. Um, part of this is party politics. Of course, you've got a ruling party in power that's uh, the longtime ruling party is in opposition, so they knew where to push the buttons in terms of the diet parliamentary debate. Um, somebody in the Coast Guard uh, decided that the video of the encounter between the fishing trawler captain and the two JCG ships uh, ought to go onto YouTube. So he leaked the video onto YouTube, inflaming the domestic debate even further. So there was a lot of in, uh, the p political party in, in antagonism, but there was also a real sense within the Japanese public that their government was really not well prepared to deal with this kind of a China. Um, and so the, sen the, the, the reference in Japan was the Senkaku Shoku which is the Senkaku shock. Uh, and it was a real shock, I think, to the idea that Japan may have, in China, a neighbor that was antagonistic or a neighbor with which they couldn't fix these problems with, you know, quietly. Um, the, no the Noda government at the time, however, did get back to discussions with Beijing, Beijing and, and the Tokyo government, negotiated a crisis communications agreement. It was announced in June of 2012. They also announced the initiative of new maritime talks across government. So Coast Guard, Education Ministry, all the people doing the surveying, right? The ge ge geologists and others, right? Um, that never actually came to fruition because by September of 2012, they were yet again in a second iteration of this kind of crisis. 
Um, I won't go too far into the details of it. If you're interested, you can certainly read the book, but this is where the nationalism topic uh, is probably, uh, it's worthwhile we spend a couple minutes talking about what's happening in Japanese domestic politics over this issue. 2010, again, you had a party in power. People were very critical, right? By 2012, you have a Japanese election. Uh, already the second crisis had emerged. The LDP, the, old, the Conservative Party, was putting candidates up for leadership. They were waiting for the opportunity for a lower house election, which was imminent by the end of the year. And that's the election that elected Mr. Abe, the current prime minister, back into power in Japan. So the Conservatives come back at the end of 2012, largely campaigning, not on an anti-China stance, but on a, we need a government that's competent enough to deal with a rising <coughs> China. All five candidates, with the one notable exception, advocated that they should stand tough on Senkaku sovereignty. The man who is currently Japan's prime minister went furthest. He said that it is time to put government officials on the Senkaku Islands. Um, so by this time, you have all the domestic politics that had led up to the national purchase of these islands by the previous government, all of the excitement by the right and the conservative right in particular became very active in raising the issue of Senkaku sovereignty, in claiming that sen the defense of the Senkaku is equal to the defense of Japan, right? Um, this was not a, 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 a platform that many conservatives would stand on prior to this, but this became the, the kind of call for action of, by the central government. And the other thing that happened is that Ishihara Shintaro, who was one of the major advocates of Senkaku nationalism, he decided that his Tokyo government could purchase these islands if the central government wouldn't do it. And so he got a little pushback from his city assembly who said you can't use our taxpayer dollars to purchase those islands and do something nationalistic like that. So he created a sen what's called the Senkaku Fund. And he basically, within a couple of weeks, had millions of dollars in his Senkaku Fund. So fundraising on behalf of the defense of the Senkakus, right? Advocacy in the leadership race of the major parties, uh, the politics around this issue transformed in large part uh, the way that the Japanese saw their relationship with China, but also elevated the island dispute itself into this is the China we have to deal with, and we need to take steps to make sure that we're willing and ad adequate to the defenses of our territory. It's a very different tone uh, in Japanese politics than you would have heard even two or three years ago. Um, Nationalism in and of itself, I look at this question of nationalism in the book. Again, it didn't start out as a book about nationalism. It didn't even start out as a book about a rising China. It started out of a book about bilateral tensions in the Japan-China relationship. But by the time I was done doing research, uh, it was pretty clear to me that one of the tasks I had to think about in my case studies was to what extent were the interests and advocates in one policy issue bleeding over and affecting other policy issues. In other words, did you have any evidence that across the board in Japan you were finding a kind of anti-China movement or a, at least a concern about China making its way uh, in, into the national debate in Japan? Were people behaving and voting on the basis of this new China? Um, I didn't find it, so that's the good news. I did find it in two issue areas where you would expect it. Obviously, one was the Yasukuni Shrine visits, which of course we can talk about, uh, which is a nationalist symbol for the Japanese. Uh, and we did find it again in this issue of the island disputes. In the maritime boundary, you have almost zero domestic activism in Japan because you don't really have a lot of inter interest groups that are sufficient to advocate on behalf of a different position by the Japanese government. Ishigaki has a small group of fishermen. They're elderly. Their voices are really not heard that much in Tokyo. And the oil and gas industry keeps its head down and is pretty low in the politics. On the food security, you had all kinds of politics, but they had nothing to do with anti-China politics. They ended up actually being consumer advocacy and other kinds of issues. So there's some issues that the Japanese and Chinese are, are confronting that are actually new issues to them. They have to do with the interdependence between the two countries. They have to do with ironically, the uh, introduction of a new maritime regime globally um, that helps create the tension between Japan and China, or at least the competition over how to resolve this East China Sea problem. Um, but in the traditional issues where the Japanese and Chinese had long sort of quietly tried to keep uh, war memory or the territorial dispute, keep it quiet and keep it well managed by the political leadership on both sides, neither of these issues are containable today 
by either government, I would suggest. But again, my book deals primarily with the Japanese side of the case. So is Japan uh, turning to the right? Is Japan more nationalistic? Well, I think it's an issue-based nationalism. I think there are certain issues that will get people on the street and that may even provide opportunity for the people who are loud and vocal nationalists, the right groups, that were very silent for a long time during the post-war period in Japan. They have a lot more political play today than they've had in the past. So again, if you're a political scientist, you talk in terms of political entrepreneurship. There's opportunity there for nationalist advocacy in Japan that wasn't there before. Chinese behavior creates even more opportunity. Today, though, I think we have a little bit of better news on the Japan-China side of things. And I'm going to stop with this and we can open it up to questions. Um, we have Abe and Xi meeting last November at the APEC meeting in Beijing. It was kind of hard to avoid a meeting uh, because China was hosting the APEC meeting, the biggest economic uh, leadership meeting in the Asia Pacific. He couldn't not invite the Prime Minister of Japan, right? And he couldn't not meet with the head of state that was coming to China. So in a way, um, the APEC hosting by China kind of forced his hand a little bit. For those of you who follow this relationship, you may know that the picture that was taken when they finally met was kind of Xi Jinping holding his hand, holding his nose, rather, uh, and Abe looking a little bit more cheerful. Um, but the optics, op optics aside, the two governments had a basic understanding that came only a couple days before that meeting happened. There were four points of agreement negotiated between the National Security Advisor in Japan and the, the Minister of the State Council. Um, and basically the two important points were that Japan would be sensitive to Chinese opinion on history. There was no mention of Yasukuni Shrine by name, uh, but basically it was an ask that the, Chinese, that the Japanese leadership not visit the Yasukuni Shrine. The second was over this East China Sea territorial issue, right? And they didn't address, they didn't say territorial dispute. Uh, this is what they said. Although we see, we, we, ha we assign different causes to our tensions in the East China Sea, we both agree on the need to reduce risk. So therein opened the doors to what is now happening and almost concluded is a risk reduction agreement between the Japanese and Chinese, a military risk reduction a set of agreements, right? But they didn't talk about territorial dispute. They didn't say it was a dispute or it wasn't a dispute. They simply acknowledged that the situation in the East China Sea was dangerous and they needed to address it. That's the first time that I know of that China has publicly acknowledged the need for risk reduction in the East China Sea. Up until that point, they were quite willing to push a little bit uh, against uh, to see what kind of response they would get both by Japan and, uh, and frankly by the US-Japan alliance. Um, but that opened the way to several other summits. Uh, we're, gonna have, we're gonna see another one this fall when the Japanese, Chinese, and South Korean leaders meet. And again, Xi and Abe are supposed to have a bilateral attached to that. Popular opinion in Japan hasn't really changed on China. If you look at the trajectory over time of public opinion polling, you see probably about 90% of the Japanese public are very skeptical about the government of China and its intentions. And this is, I would argue, and I argue in the book, this public element to the relationship is new. The skepticism of the Japanese public about China and about their own government's ability to deal with that China is very high. For the first time in last year's public opinion polling, and these polls have been taken by the same organization, along with the China Daily on the Chinese side, for over a decade now, and last year's poll re re revealed that about 30% of Japanese think that their country is inevitably going to have, be in a military conflict with China. Again, for those of you who have studied post-war Japan, it's almost unthinkable that the Japanese public would imagine themselves in a war with anyone, right? Um, so don't underestimate the depth of popular f anxiety about this relationship, and, the, and it's not necessarily translating into an anti-China movement politically in Japan, but it's also deep skepticism about their own government's will, able, ability to uh, defend Japanese interests in the face of this new China. Um, I'm going to stop here with one last comment about so what for the United States. And I think I've been sitting in Washington, D.C. throughout the 2010-2012 crisis. I wrote about it. There's a piece I wrote in April of 2013 it's like what's called a contingency planning memo. It's a kind of thought piece that we all have to do about what happens if, right? And how are US interests engaged? Um, so I've watched our government deal with this. 
<coughs> excuse me, and I've watched the United States and Japanese governments negotiate the latest in the U.S.-Japan bilateral defense cooperation guidelines that really tries to address this, what the Japanese call this gray zone contingency in the East China Sea by which, of course, they mean white halls and not gray halls. <laughs> but the, the, the worry is, of course, the Japanese, the Chinese are going to pressure Japan, not at a direct level of military engagement, but just underneath it. And that there's a certain incrementalism and opportunism in the way the Chinese are putting pressure uh, across the East China Sea. Um, the US Japan now have a common understanding of what those anxieties are. Uh, we have, for the first time in the relationship, stood up a 24-7 uh, crisis management mechanism for the US-Japan alliance. Again, um, it's important to remember the US and Japan didn't ha don't have a joint command, right? They don't have joint war planning. We don't have war plans with the Japanese, right? We exercise. We do tabletop exercise. But we're not like, it's not like the US are okay alliance or like NATO. We, we have largely, and the Japanese have largely seen them Selves as a support base for an American forward deployed strike force. In other words, the conflict would be the Korean Peninsula, perhaps Taiwan Straits, perhaps elsewhere. Japan provides bases, supplies, logistics, but Japan is not on the receiving end of a first use of force. That has changed. Uh, that's the new perception in Tokyo, that for the first time they, they could imagine themselves potentially be it inadvertent or miscalculation at the root cause, but they could potentially find themselves uh, receiving uh, some kind of attack or some kind of escalatory dynamic with the Chinese. And now the dilemma is to make sure the United States is involved. Up until this time, we have in Washington over the decades largely been making sure the Japanese <laughs> were attached to work with us on regional issues. Now I think the alliance dilemma has shifted. And for the Japanese, it's not in fear of entrapment anymore that's the problem. It's the fear of abandonment. And so when you go to Tokyo, which I'm sure many of you will, uh, just be sensitive to the fact that there is a new, you'll be asked a lot about uh, the American commitment to Tokyo, whether we're really going to be there if there's a contingency. Uh, are we going to really defend the Senkaku Islands? Um, so you'll hear it from the public. I hear it all the time from the public. Um, but the alliance has now a qualitatively different feel for Tokyo and for Washington, for that matter, um, than it has in the past. So let me stop there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like to handle the questions? I can handle the questions if there are any. Yes. Yes. Just curious. You mentioned the Japanese people are concerned with China. What's the popular? attitude towards the Japanese government's recent uh, changing of the rules of using the self-defense force, right. uh, loosening the restrictions. Are they in favor of a buildup and greater use? Or it could seem like there's a, a fairly decent uh, opposition yep. to the government. So I think probably Dick, Dick Samuels was here <laughs> probably talking about this a little while ago. Um, my sense is, and I wrote a piece about this, I can share it with Bill if, if you're interested, but from looking at Japanese public opinion polling over time, you see two things. One, that the self-defense force gradually becomes accepted as a legitimate post-war military force. They don't use the word military, they say self-defense force, to be consistent with Article 9, right? Um, and they largely did that domestically over the 60s and 70s with humanitarian disaster relief. They didn't do it out of any war fighting kind of role for themselves. The latest disaster, of course, up in uh, Fukushima, in, in Tohoku area, self-defense forces became the most highly regarded institution in Japan in response to that national crisis, right? Beyond the elected elites, beyond the local governments, it was the self-defense forces that performed well. And the Japanese public recognized that. But even with the skepticism and this anxiety about the rise of China, you don't see the Japanese public embracing a military option in response. Not, n not like you would expect if it was an American audience worried about our defense, you would immediately s go to the military response, right? You would expect them to be supportive of it. And this is for their nation's own self-defense, right? So it's, mi it's a bit mixed. When it comes to Senkakus, when you, do po when you find polling data, should we defend, should we use force? Absolutely. In defense of Japanese territory, there's not much doubt. Um, should we... Uh, change the Constitution, or should we, as Mr. Abe has done, reinterpret the Constitution? And then you start to get a bifurcation. And so last July, 
the Prime Minister announced that he would reinterpret, the Cabinet announced reinterpretation of Article 9 to allow the military to work with us and to work in PKO in a more, you know, a, a more fulsome manner, put it that way, um, and to support us by provision of ammunition and, and supplies, right? So if we are fighting, some of our U.S. forces are fighting from Japan somewhere else, they can supply us, right? They can help us, but they don't have to fight with us, right? Um, that, you get the, the polling data basically comes down to about 30-30. Yes, it's a good thing. No, it's not a good thing. But the other 60%, 50 to 60, depending on which polling data you're using, they don't know the answer to it. So there's a lot of, I'm not sure, out there in the Japanese public polling data. 30% um, yes, we ought to beef up our military, we ought to be doing uh, more alongside the United States and others in the region. 30% are ad adamantly against it. But that 60% I don't know answer is a pretty telling comment, I think, about where public opinion is right now. And I think the big challenge, given this summer we had this very contentious people that demonstrating in the streets that the legislation was in the parliament, the, the response to the Abe cabinet by his critics is harsh. These are war bills. We don't want anything to do with it, right? But if you, again, look at the polling data, 80-some uh, percent from the conservative newspaper or the liberal, right? 80-some percent of respondents say he hasn't explained it well enough. I don't know what he's trying to do. Um, so again, I think there's a little bit of uh, responsibility on the government's part to be a little bit more engaged in s messaging what their intent is and what they're trying to do. I think it'll take a lot to s persuade the Japanese people that sending their forces abroad or actually using force on behalf of other militaries, that they're comfortable with it. So that's the polling data answer. Um, I, I, again, I think the Prime Minister and the Cabinet are aware that they've got more work to do. So I wouldn't expect any quick behavioral changes uh, on the horizon. Nope. Yes. Oh, you sorry. mentioned briefly the, uh, the Chinese embargo on the export of yeah. their elements. Uh, that was looked at from a couple of angles. Um, how much do you think that is economic leverage? Because at the time, Japan was actually processing. It was a third amount of their economy was processing those rare earth elements out of China. The Chinese are now processing the elements themselves. Yep. And that part of the Japanese economy has all but disappeared. Yep. Um, is that a negotiating piece, or is that a, 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 another step on a march by the Chinese to have the corner on a strategic material? I think it's the latter. But um, the Chinese have advocated since, I think it's 2004, 2005, but don't quote me. I'm not quite sure which, where it was. Somewhere around the mid-2000s, they began to say we want to restrain our exports of rare earths for two reasons. One is the extractive. They wanted to develop their own extractive capability. Two, there were environmental impacts. They, they claimed environmental impact concerns. Uh, and three, they needed it themselves, right? So they identified rare earth exports as, a, as somewhere they wanted to pull back. And they, they introduced a quota system. And so the Japanese had annually been having talks with the Chinese government over that quota. What was the right amount of quota? How quickly they were going to reduce Japanese share and things like that. So that was ongoing before the 2010 crisis, right? Uh, but the Japanese always felt that they were cutting too much, that the quota was unacceptable. And under, under the WTO, in fact, it's a monopoly exercise, and so it violates WTO laws. But until 2010, the, you know, the United States and the Europeans took the Chinese to the WTO. They had a case ed that they had put forward. And I can't remember which year. I think it was 2008 that they put it forward. The Japanese wouldn't join the case until the 2010 uh, issue and their experience with the informal embargo. And in response, they joined the WTO case against the Chinese for the quota system itself. Um, they've also diversified. So they're in conversations with India. Uh, they have an agreement now with India. There's been some talk with Vietnam, although I don't know the extent of the agreement. Uh, but they've been seeking diversified sourcing. Uh, I think up until 2010, 80% of their rare earth came from China. So they were heavily, heavily dependent, which again goes to show you how unprepared they were for this shift in the relationship. They didn't think strategically that this is a vulnerability. They had a decent enough relationship. There was a win-win economic bargain. They hadn't diversified. Now they are. Um, some of you who are more expert on the UN law of the sea will also know that seabed 
uh, rare earth exploration and rights to seabed resources, including the rare earths, are currently being discussed under what I think is called the Jamaica Round or the Jamaica Pro Protocol. Um, so the seabed UNCLOS has another aspect of this to introduce, which is there's new places to explore for a rare earth. And all countries that have high-tech industries are going to have to think about this because rare earths are integral to any kind of consumer goods, cell phones, everything that we use all the time has rare earth minerals <laughs> in it. So it's a serious problem, not only for the Japanese, but for all of us. Um, China, I don't know what the full proportion of China today, what their supply is globally, but it's a large, it's over 50%, 60 or something. I didn't realize it was that high, but yeah, yeah, so there you go. Um, but Japan had not thought it possible. And again, I think the Europeans and the Americans had tried to change Chinese behavior through the WTO, um, but that doesn't reduce the dependency. It just adjudicates, it's an attempt to adjudicate the differences, right, of the quota system. Yeah. So what are Japanese attitudes, uh, official but uh, more so uh, public opinion, in terms of the other uh, disputes uh, so, you know, Philippines, yeah. Vietnam, and whatnot, particularly in the context of, in recent uh, days, we've heard uh, the U.S. military leadership uh, at PACOM, Admiral Swift, Admiral Harris, basically signaling yeah. that the U.S. is, is signaling uh, an intent to ramp up a more muscular uh, sovereignty uh, patrol reaction right. to the island building. Right. So I'm just wondering, is, is there sort of a a common cause here, or is it sort of, well, that's different, that's their problem, nothing to do with us? Um, so, no to both of those. That's not their problem. Well, two, two pieces of the puzzle, which is Japanese interpretations of our behavior, and it would probably surprise, not surprise you that they're quite critical of our inability or lack of action on this issue on the South China Sea. So um, that's one piece. So the alliance, again, getting back to the alliance dynamic between the United States and Japan, it has shifted considerably now. They have a huge stake in having us be a much more assertive maritime power and defender of the maritime status quo. Um, you will, if you go and visit your naval counterparts in the the in, in Tokyo, uh, they will without fail tell you that our in, our lack of ratification of UNCLOS is a huge mistake. Uh, and so, whether it, whether it's because of lawfare, <laughs> you know, the Chinese responding to Chinese lawfare is what they the words they use, of course, um, or whether it's just because the United States is not well positioned to to work alongside their allies in the UN law of the sea. Um, it doesn't matter. They want us in UNCLOS and they want it ratified as soon as possible. Um, so that's one. Um, on the South China Sea specific issue of the land reclamation, um, they of course have access to ISR capabilities. That, that that's If you look on a map, it's not that far away from Okinawa. <laughs> I mean it is, but it isn't. Where am I? Let's see if I can get the good map. I think that last, oopsie, sorry. I'm supposed to point that way. Did it go away? There we go. So it's not really, really close, <laughs> but that little piece of land right up there is Taiwan, right? The ones unidentified up there. Um, Okinawa is really not very far away from Taiwan. <laughs> so where all of their ISR, most of their ISR capability right now is concentrated in, in um, not all of it, but a lot of it is concentrated in Okinawa. So some of the ISR that you're seeing photographs of, uh, I suspect it's not uh, coming from the United States, it's coming from Japan, but I, I don't quote me on that one. Oh, we are on YouTube, never mind. Um, <laughs> I suspect uh, that there's not, on, there's not only one source of ISR uh, in the public domain. Um, you know, the Chinese and the behavior in the South China Sea, I think it's the Chinese that separate East China Sea from South China Sea. They see it very differently. And in a lot of the track 1.5s that I'm engaged in, they'll say they're different problems. South China Sea, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> of course, is the nine dash line. And the historical, that's China's. It was taken away under imperialism. It's ours. We're going to, you know, this is a historical issue for them. Go to the East China Sea, um, the language is something like the Japanese robbed us of those islands. <laughs> the Japanese took it and it, they need to give it back. Um, so they view it differently. I think in behavioral terms, of course, there's two very uh, f strong and sturdy U.S. alliances in the East China Sea. Our alliance with Japan, our alliance with South Korea. So the United States 
has a stake in what happens in the East China Sea. It may have a stake in terms of uh, freedom of navigation, in terms of supporting lawful, peaceful dispute resolution, but it doesn't have boots on the ground um, presence in that region. Um, so there's differences, right? The Chinese see it differently and they talk about it differently. And I think you can see in the interaction with the land reclamation now that some of those differences are, are causing some policy dilemmas for us. Um, I think the freedom of navigation issue is, I, I suspect, you, you have had some pretty strong, uh, conspicuous statements in the last couple of days. I suspect you're going to see a freedom of navigation uh, activity sometime soon. I suspect that our Australian allies may be with us. Japanese could be with us too. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, say that the Japanese are uninterested in what happens in the South China Sea. Um, the head of the Joint Staff, Admiral Kawano, two and a half months ago, uh, has an interview in the Wall Street Journal in which he says that Chinese behavior in the South China Sea, should it continue, uh, that, that, that Japan would find it uh, important to consider ISR in the China, in South China Sea. So he basically said, if this keeps going, our interests are going to be uh, affected. He only talked about ISR. He didn't talk about any kind of surface action or anything like that, but just ISR. Um, he was then in the United States at the invitation of General Dempsey. Uh, so he has had adequate opportunity to consult with the United States government on, on a variety of issues. I suspect South China Sea may have been one of them. But I wouldn't, th there's two things about the Chinese intentions in the South China Sea, of course, there's two ways to think about it. One is they want to defend the islands. In other words, they want to, they, they see this as their sovereignty and they're going to defend it. That's one. Um, the second is, uh, and this is a language that the J Chinese PLA will use in their interactions at times with some of us in the Track 2 world or Track 1.5 world, and that is force projection. Power, um, and if it's force projection, of course, then you're really talking about sea lanes and the vulnerability of sea lanes uh, and other kinds of things that, of course, would worry the maritime pow powers <laughs> of East Asia, not just the Japanese, but the Australians and everybody else in East Asia who depends on a stable use of the Malacca Straits or any kind of stable sea lane, uh, maintenance, maintenance of, of stable sea lanes, right? So if the Chinese begin to talk about their land reclamation and their activities on these islands in the South China Sea as part of a grander uh, you know, power projection <laughs> intent, then I think you'll find that the Japanese will take it a very, it's not just about islands <laughs> or about dispute resolution, peaceful dispute resolution. It becomes a fundamental shift, I think, in the maritime uh, management, let's put it that way, of, of East Asia. Yes, sir. Um, could you comment on the, uh, the trilateral uh, dialogue between Japan, India, and uh, yes. the United States in the context of Sino-Japanese relations? And now that after 2007, the multilateral exercises have been divided. And currently, they're on the way of I believe in Malabar right now, this week, isn't, isn't the Malabar exercise this week? So ja the Japan and the United States and India are conducting uh, exercises now, as we speak. Um, I was in Delhi in 2012, um, discussing this with some of your um, foreign policy and, and maritime experts. Um, Japan has long seen uh, a positive for Japan-India strategic dialogue. And again, maritime first and foremost, right? So that your Navy and the Japanese Navy have a long-standing now set of exercises and a conversation. What was happening by the time I got there in, in, in 2012 was your air forces were talking to each other and even the ground self-defense force, the Japanese Army and the, and the Indian Army were having a bilat you know, discussion. So I think the, the Prime Minister Modi, when he went to Tokyo, uh, was it last last year, right? Um, he upped the strategic consultations. Uh, important, I forget. The, they added one more word to make it an even more strate important strategic dialogue. But I think the dialogue between the two countries are very, very important. For the United States, um, I think the exercises this week are incredibly vital for the, us understanding the way in which and where the opportunities are for us. Uh, I think at some point you might expect the Australians would like to participate as well uh, because I don't have a big extended map, but maybe we can, but the Indo-Pacific, you know, making sure that we have maritime stability or at least maritime management um, practices in place that go all the way from East Asia around to the Gulf of Hormuz is important for all of our countries. 
uh, when the United States, what I heard when I went to Delhi, which I was fascinated by, because I'm, I'm not a South Asia expert, um, but was the argument that kept being made by your government was that the United States doesn't quite understand the implications of its withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, and that withdrawal from Afghanistan then leaves a, a section, a maritime section, uh, a little bit less populated by U.S. forces than, than would be uh, comfortable. So I think we have a lot to think about, frankly, um, in the way that we, we tend to see this all about East Asia, but in fact it's an Indo-Pacific stretch. Um, the Japanese already are very active in the Gulf of Aden, in the anti-piracy, the multilateral anti-piracy, in large part that they have managed to help um, gain some capacities through that participation in that exercise. I think they're looking for other alternatives and, and ways in which the, the India connection can help add to the multilateraliz multilateralization of that part uh, of their engagement. So I think the United States is very positive about it, and I think you know at some point maybe ha having a conversation with Australia would be an important part of the puzzle. But again, I don't have a readout from the Malabar because I think it's ongoing this week, uh, and I'm, I'm very curious to see what the experiences are. I'll be in Tokyo, I'll be in Beijing and Tokyo next week, and I'm hoping to talk to some of the Japanese uh, Maritime Self-Defense Forces about that experience. But I know for a fact that Tokyo welcomes it. Uh, it's, incredibly, uh, it's incredibly important for them. Any other questions? Okay, yes. Sheila. Oh, I there's a gentleman behind you waving at me. I thought you had left. But but he reappeared. <laughs> I had my meeting. It was very good. Um, I don't know if someone's asked this, but I'm nope. curious about the demographic dimension of Japan. Mm. Japan is an aging country. It is. Um, as a result, that cannot help but influence its military calculations. Yeah. It's, uh, view of the, the reliance of the U.S. alliance. Uh, I just wonder, how does that play into this like, oh, that you know? So all of what Mr. Abe is trying to do in the economic realm, uh, Abenomics, for those of you who follow it, which is really trying to revitalize and make more competitive the Japanese economy. Um, monetary fiscal stimulus is the short run, but the real serious um, focal point for him is the structural reforms. And uh, largely this is to address the aging society and uh, driven by the demographics, right? So I, somewhere on the realm, by 2040, somewhere on the realm of about 60% of Japanese will be at or in retirement. I mean, it's pretty dramatic, huge. So public policy at the moment focuses on, first of all, what he calls womenomics, which is getting women into the workforce in a much more supported way to encourage Japanese women, 50% of the population, <laughs> to be fully engaged economically. They, they're going to need to have their women, frankly, engaged fully in the economy. Second is you don't see it on the surface quite so much, and nobody advocates it in quite the way I'm about to explain it, but is immigration. And I think they're going to have targeted immigration in particular sectors of their economy, but clearly you can't get Product, higher productivity out of Japan, given the demographics, unless you have A, more women working, and B, uh, the assistance of immigration. They're going to have to import labor. Uh, it's just a fact. How they do it remains to be seen, and what the political cost of that is remains to be seen. Um, the long-term impact on the self-defense force is pretty obvious, right? They have a small military to begin with in terms of population. Their ground self-defense force, I think, is about, I think the ceiling is about 140,000. And they never meet it. So some of that will be reserve. I think what they actually meet in terms of recruitment is somewhere like 115 or 110, something like that, right? So, and that's with a lot of, <laughs> a lot of strenuous effort. Um, they don't pay their, 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 their military goes to four years of college, they don't pay for it. And there's no commitment to serve, although they've begun to change that, right? So incentivizing coming into the ground self-defense, uh, to the self-defense forces, I should say. Um, the, the Navy, the Maritime Self-Defense Force, and the Air Self-Defense Force actually have a much smaller number. They're about 20,000 each. Uh, but they also get the, high, the technical guys, uh, the, the fighter pilots, the radar guys. They have a higher level of engineering and technical expertise. I suspect that's the same for us. Um, they don't have any problems filling their quota in those two services. Um, but again, there are limits, or just recruitment limits, on how big an army the Japanese, or military at large, the Japanese can field. Um, 
The dependence on the United States question, I think the demographic is just one more layer of that cake, frankly. I think the, the big problem for them is going to be to make sure the United States is still engaged fully in their defenses, that we're fully present in the region, that we're not cutting back our forces. Um, there's a lot of worry about the impact of sequestration. There's a lot of worry about the flare-up in Syria and everything redirecting the Asia pivot or rebalance, however you want to call it, away from what uh, several defense secretaries now have uh, articulated is we are sending our most modern weaponry to the Asia Pacific. We are sending, uh, we are ensuring that we're, our maritime presence continues to be at the, si the, the level, if not l higher than it is. There's a lot of statements being made about future projections that the Asia Pacific is the theater of the future for the US military. Um, but the, the proof will be in the pudding for the Japanese. They want to make sure we stay uh, and we stay present in a very conspicuous way. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you.